start talking. It'll be a while before you get to talk to Hi, uh, I'm Juliette Berger, and I'm the president of Washtenaw Audubon Society, and we're so delight delighted that we get to have a joint meeting with the Sierra Club here on Valley Group, who have uh, quite a number of people here tonight, and we have a ton of people on Zoom, so hi to everyone on Zoom. Um, I want to uh, start the program by reading our uh, Washtenaw Audubon's DEI statement, and then I have a couple announcements that are pretty important about our group and who we are going to be going forward. So um, the birds that Washtenaw Audubon pledges to protect differ in color, size, behavior, geographical preference, and countless other ways. As we honor and celebrate the equal, equally remarkable diversity of the human species, Washtenaw Audubon considers the work of inclusion, diversity, and word. Uh, we hope that in doing so, we can bring a new creativity and energy to our work in Washtenaw County and beyond for birds and people alike. Respect, inclusion, and opportunity for people of all backgrounds, lifestyles, and perspectives will attract the best ideas and harness the greatest passion to shape a healthier, more vibrant future for all of us who share our planet. We believe that protecting and conserving nature and the environment transcends political, cultural, and social boundaries. Um, and as an organization, we are committed to increasing the diversity of our board, volunteers, members, and supporters. As an organization, Washtenaw Audubon strives to create a sense of community where all people can feel safe to explore nature and experience the wonder of birds. We respect the individuality of each member of our community and welcome all without discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, age, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, national or ethnic origin, politics or veteran status or any other status. All are welcome to bird with us, learn with us, and share our passion for birds and the environment. Um, I want to give a hearty welcome to everyone, and uh, I'm so glad to see all of you here in the room and on Zoom. Um, it means a lot that you're all here together. Um, I have a few important announcements about uh, Things happening in Washington Audubon in particular. Um, in October, we voted to drop Audubon from our name based on um, some despicable history that we had found out about Audubon. And this is a movement going on throughout the country. And uh, so our members voted overwhelmingly, a huge majority to drop Audubon. And then we've had committees and meetings and public uh, input and we have come up with a new name and we all we need all of the members of Washington Audubon to show up for our program here next month, uh, March 20th, to ratify our new name, uh, which is Washtenaw Bird and Nature Alliance. And I'm thank you. Thank you. I'm particularly excited about Washtenaw Bird and Nature Alliance because we do so many things that are not just birds. I mean, we love the birds are crazy about birds. I'm insane about birds. But, um, you know, if you've ever been on one of our nature walks or tree walk or butterfly walks or um, moth night, which is hugely popular and many of our moth nights, we, we have people who never come to a bird walk. So, um, so Bird and Nature Alliance really captures more of who we are. Have you been to Moth Night? It's fantastic. We have some moth experts in our membership who just really knock it out of the park. Um, so we'll need a certain percentage. Does anyone remember? Do you remember, Diana, of our membership to ratify that new name? Do you remember, Keith? How, what percentage of our membership we need? 64 out of 67 votes. No, no, I mean oh. for next time. Uh, we, need a, we need minimum of 5%. 5% of our membership needs to vote yes with the thumbs up for the new name. 
and then we can go about making the changes that we need to be doing business as Washtenaw Bird and Nature Alliance. Um, the other thing that's coming up that I want everyone to know is next month, next month, March 20th, will be the last meeting for a while that we're doing here at MathEye. We have um, made an, uh, an alliance with the uh, Ann Arbor District Library, and we're going to be using the downtown library space. It's accessible by public transportation, which this place is not. And so, at, and there's ample underground parking there, uh, tons and tons of hundreds of parking spots. And we're going to be using, at least to begin with, the front room as you walk in, which has a 50, thousand dollar screen or it might even be more than that is the coolest projection system I've ever seen and so none of our programs are going to look washed out not that this one is mm -hmm. but I've been to a few programs myself here where one fantastic photographer is showing his photos and they look like mine which are not <laughs> good <laughs> not good yeah um so so come April I'm not sure who our speaker will be. I'm going to be in Texas, mm -hmm. but someone will be providing a very fantastic show a program in April, the uh, third Wednesday of April at the Ann Arbor District Library. We will still be using this space for various things like the Christmas bird count potluck, maybe something to do with the May count. Um, and we may come back here if our experience with the library is not satisfactory. We are not breaking up with MathEye. But any of you who have been to one or more of our programs have experienced the many, many technical difficulties that we've had with this space. And the district library offers us an AV person who stays with us through the entire program. And they are not charging us anything because we're a community partner. So why not? You will have a good experience both on Zoom and in person if uh, once we move. Um, we have lots of field trips and programs coming up. Usually I ask people, what are your cool bird sightings? Uh, does anyone have a cool bird sighting? I know that there are short-eared owls at the Conservancy Farm, and I haven't got there yet because I just got back from Florida, but I'm going to be there maybe tomorrow night. Anything else? Um, our Thursday morning walks of the ARP start up on Thursday, the last Thursday in March. So that's just a few weeks in about a month's time. And uh, check our website. Have already been too, but... Oh, you think so? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Dan says the warblers might already have been through there, uh, through our area by then. If it stays this warm, you're probably right. Um, check the website, washingtonaudubon.org or our Facebook page uh, for all the information about both the name change ratification. Every uh, weekend we have a field trip of some sort, so uh, check that out and please come. You don't have to be a member to go on of 90% of our trips. We're going to the UP this weekend and that one was for members only, but other than that, almost everything is free for anybody who wants to come. The bees um, have been out some of these warm days. Oh my goodness, Sherry tells me that bees have been out some of these warm days. Probably making a bad mistake. Bad decision. I. I can tell you that I was out at Barton Pond today and I was covered with some kind of insect hatch. They were crawling all over my neck, some kind of a fish fly or something. It was not that great. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Ezekiel, who is the program chair for uh, the Sierra Club here on Valley and um, take it away, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. We are so delighted to be meeting jointly with, yes. with, I can say it one last time, watch the Audubon. Uh, oh, and you'll introduce Joan, right? Yes. Okay. And um, first off, I want to thank Una Woodbury for helping with the tech here tonight. And I say this with a sniffle because she's going to graduate in a couple months and yeah. we'll, we'll be losing her. Um, and Erica, Erica uh, is also helping us tonight, and and also Jason Frenzel, our chair, is is home 
helping tonight to make the to make the Zoom possible. Uh, so Sierra Club, we're the nation's uh, largest and oldest environmental group. Our our motto is explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. And we'd love to have you join us, uh, which you can do at sierraclub.org. And I think it costs $15 for a year. And as Juliet said, I'm the I'm the program chair for the Huron Valley Group, which is Washington and two other adjoining uh, counties. And we're gonna we're gonna do two little traditions that we do at our meetings, and then we are going to have two announcements, and then we are going to have our wonderful speaker, Joan Kellenberg. So the first tradition we're going to do, and you are all the people that are here are about to participate. Uh, you're going to stand up, you're going to walk over, you're going to find somebody that you don't already know and introduce yourself and tell them why you came. And we'll do that for about three minutes. All righty, finish your sentence, but not your paragraph. Finish your sentence, but not your paragraph. <laughs> and the other, the other tradition that we're going to say is our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that all the lands where the Huron Valley Group operates are the homelands of the Mississauga, Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, and other Native peoples. And we always want to, we always want to be aware that this land was first settled by those people and that they are still among us and, and we need to respect them and respect the land. Uh, two quick announcements and then we'll get to our program. Uh, first of all, the Huron Valley Group, we write letters to voters on election years. Uh, we write to people who, oh, the nickname is escaping me, but they're people who are registered to yeah, low, low, in, low inclination or something like that. Voters, they, they are people who are registered to vote, but they don't always vote. And we bank up our letters. We don't send them when we write them. We send them just before the election. We we go through a group called Vote Forward. And in 2020 and in 2022, we we wrote over 1,500 handwritten letters to voters in both years. And we're starting up next month. So it's always going to be on the second Tuesday, and it's always going to be from six to eight in the evening, and it's always going to be at Argus Farm Stop, the one on Packard at the corner of Dewey. So there are two Argus Farm Stops close together. This is the one that's on the corner of Dewey by the burrito place, and you go down, and when you get there, you go down in the basement. So again, 
uh, March 12th, 6 to 8 p.m., uh, Argus Farm stop on Packard. We ask if you can to please bring 20 envelopes and 20 stamps. Uh, we'll bring the letters and the addresses and so on. Uh, but if you can't bring stamps and postage, the important thing is to bring your heartfelt uh, reasons why people should vote in this coming election. And I bet if you rack your brains, you can think of a good reason. Um, so yeah. And our next program is here. It is on Tuesday, March 19th, uh, 7.30 p.m. And John Mursky is going to come and Wayne Appleyard, and they will be talking about home electrification and using heat pumps to heat your home. So I think that'll be a pretty high interest uh, presentation. So again, uh, Tuesday, March 19th, here, 7.30, and also on our usual Zoom link. And that brings us to our program. And I would like to present Joan Kellenberg. She's an Ann Arborite, she's a birder. Um, and she's gonna, she's gonna tell you her own story. And all I'm gonna say is uh, I met her on the beach where we, <laughs> where we were watching piping plovers together and, and one thing led to another. So please welcome Joan Kellenberg. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you for the invitation to Dan and to Juliet. Um, I've known Juliet a while, been on some of her wonderful walks in the area. Uh, and Dan, as he said, I met uh, on the beach last August as I was doing my job up north, educating the public on piping plovers and up walk Dan. So um, here we all are several months later. Um, I want to thank the folks who are online that are attending today and all of you in the room. This is uh, exciting, really, to be able to share my experience and hopefully to uh, encourage some or all of you to consider being a uh, Great Lakes piping plover advocate. Um, there's not enough hyperbole to really um, shower praise on the group at Sleeping Bear Dunes that conducts this conservation work. Um, remarkable individuals and the birds are also remarkable and will capture your heart. So I am speaking on behalf of the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore uh, Piping Plover team. For disclosures, I'm a volunteer. I am not on staff in the National Park System. I'm also not a piping plover expert. I am simply and have been for three years a volunteer up north. I'm also speaking specifically about the Sleeping Bear Dunes piping plovers. Other Great Lakes states also have terrific conservation efforts underway, and we cheer one another along as our pairs increase state by state. Kudos to all of them. Also, I'm well aware that I am talking to two groups, both in the room and online. Some of you are expert birders, and I'm trying not to be too intimidated standing up here in front of you, <laughs> and others, maybe not so much, okay? But what I'm going to do is try to aim it right down the middle of the road, less technical, more descriptive, with lots of enthusiasm. My goal for today, my hidden agenda, is to try to encourage some of you to join the team up north because the way that I stumbled on this team three years ago still really makes me smile. I never saw it coming and it has really changed my life. So if you are inspired during or at the end of my presentation, I'm gonna encourage you to get your spots at the DHD campground reserved now. And I guarantee you that your life and your perspective will change if you see these birds up close and then, as I did, begin to learn their names and their stories. I'm going to start at the beginning with the names of the team rather than leaving it at the end, because this really is the intention of this presentation, is to call out the remarkable dedication of this team. Vince Cavallari is the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore Wildlife Biologist. 
Eric Adams, who is on the line right now, is the Piping Plover team lead. What a remarkable effort she leads up north. And her team of dedicated, lovely, friendly, encouraging, enthusiastic, heroic team. Chelsea Loomis, Tess Kohler, Craig Campo, McKenna Nelson, Sarah Dibbett, and at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Cuthbert, who my understanding is back in the 80s when U.S. Fish and Wildlife was ready to give up on the piping plovers because they were so close to extinction, she said, nonsense. We are going to try to do what we can and bring them back from the brink. And so since the 1980s, when this bird went on the endangered species list, she has been training undergraduates and graduate students who come to Sleeping Bear Dunes and give their time during the summers. And three of her staff members, uh, two of whom I have met, also remarkable. Alice Van Zoren has been at this for 20 years. This woman is completely remarkable, and I have had the good fortune of having several conversations with her. Alice Van Zoren is the granddaughter of Eli Gallup, for whom Gallup Park is named. She is an Ann Arbor native, and to watch her in action, it's a work of beauty. She is an expert, and she is one of three individuals who, under Dr. Cuthbert's federal license, are able to band these birds. Some of them tiny chicks in the hand, some of them adults. But Alice is a marvel to watch. Stephanie Schubel, who I have not met personally, and Scott Mills, who is now being trained by Alice Van Zoren to ban the birds. And between Alice and Scott, they take turns, one week turns out on North Manitou Island with the wind howling from the middle of April until the birds leave in August, one week rotations, monitoring head counts of chicks, eggs, adult birds, and banding them. It's absolutely remarkable. <laughs> so here they are, not all of them, but most of them. And you can see they are doing what they love to do best, which is looking in their binoculars, looking in their scopes, and doing daily head counts of miles and miles of lakeshore. You can also see Alice there in the lower left-hand photo um, working her bird banding magic. And Chelsea Loomis, who texted me this morning when I told her I was going to include the picture of her in the middle photo there, covered in midges, she said to me, tell them we love midge season up here. <laughs> the midges don't bite at the end of May, but they are terrific clover food. So that's the dedication that I'm talking about. <laughs> and two public events, the up, upper left and then the lower right. Um, those photos I took at uh, a public event last summer. And public education is an ongoing uh, effort because the more of us that understand remarkable uh, efforts that are going on in our state, the more likely we are to commit or for the most part, share the shore with these lovely birds. Now I'm gonna take us back a number of decades because I wanna start with a success story before I talk about the plovers. You all recognize this bird. We, when we see this bird flying over Southeastern Michigan or up North, most of us are in awe of this bird. But this bird, the bald eagle, came very close to extinction in the 1960s. And by 1978, it was listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife across most of the lower 48, with the exception of a handful of states, including Michigan, where it was listed as threatened. Interestingly enough, it was not listed as either threatened or endangered in Alaska. And that is exactly where I saw this bird for the first time. I was working in a summer camp south of Anchorage the summer after my senior year in high school. And I looked up and I saw what I thought was a small plane. I had <laughs> never seen a bird that size in my life from Northern Indiana and it took my breath away. I still remember that bird in the air. There were also huge owls up there and I had never seen owls that size, but 
I knew that that, danger, that bird was on the endangered species list. I didn't know that it wasn't listed in Alaska. But I remember thinking to myself as a senior in high school, why is that bird on the endangered species list? It's huge, it's majestic, it looks powerful, it takes your breath away. How in the world did it get on the endangered species list? Well, we know now the story, right? This is the remarkable, successful story of conservation around this bird. Starting in 1972, when the US EPA banned DDT. Most of you probably know the story behind DDT, which was a pesticide that was sprayed over agricultural land, ended up in the water uh, supply where it was consumed by fish and those fish were cons consumed by bald eagles. And bald eagles, by consuming DDT, were not able to produce strong enough eggshells. So when the birds would try to incubate their eggs, they would break the eggshells. That was a huge reason for their plummeting numbers. People got wise, DDT was banned, and in 1978, as I said, the bird was put on the endangered or threatened species list with goals to increase recovery, and I put this in red for a reason, to, through captive breeding programs, reintroduction efforts, law enforcement, and nest protection during breeding season. All of those you'll see later in my slides. So multi-pronged approach to protect the birds. Birds were reclassified then uh, as threatened in the lower 48 in 1995. And by 2007, the bald eagle came off of the threatened species list. A remarkable effort. Federal, state, local agencies, and a cadre of volunteers like us that were proponents for this bird over the over the decades. And by the way, the bald eagle is still protected under the Migrat Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Bald and uh, Golden Eagle Protection Act. So I want to start with his success story because it's going to be important for us to keep things positive. <laughs> Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. And there are two other birds that have um, benefited enormously from being on the endangered species list in Michigan. Room full of birders. I know you know what one of them is. Kirtland's Warbler. Kirtland's Warbler. Absolutely. Yes. A uh, bird that resides up north, jack pine uh, forest of a specific height, very specific habitat um, needs, and uh, it was delisted several years ago. And the second bird, the one we're going to talk about today. That is right. Yes. And its story, of course, is ongoing. Okay. So this is a story being told. It's the reason that, I, that I'm here today to tell the story to you. So I just want you to meditate on this slide for a minute. Okay. This is the cute factor coming through very intentionally. Um, and the photo on the lower left is a behavior called brooding. So the chicks cannot regulate their temperature in the first week or so of their life. And they need to huddle under the adults, both the mother and the father, huddle under the adults for, um, for body warmth. And uh, sometimes you will see a bird with six to eight legs. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable to watch. The chicks are very persistent, so they, they get under there. Um, but anyway, this is the cute factor slide. And when you see these chicks on the beach, as Dad, uh, Dan did last summer, um, it really captures your heart. They look like small golf balls, fuzzy, on stilts. That's the best description, OK? They run fast, they grow fast, but this is what they look like at the beginning. Now, the other thing that I love about the piping plover is its call. And piping plovers are intentionally so well camouflaged that many times you cannot see them on the beach. You have to hear them first, and then you direct your, your vision in that general direction. So I'm going to see if I can successfully play the call for you. Um, it is a two-note high-low peep, but they are called 
piping plovers for a reason, and it is the, the sound we refer to as peeplo. So pretty magical, pretty magical. And uh, you hear that sound, you use your peripheral vision a lot when you're trying to uh, locate piping plovers, but hearing them first is uh, usually the, the signal of where they're, of where they're uh, hiding. My story, as I said, came purely by serendipity. My husband, John, in the back of the room and I were walking down Sleeping Bear Point in 2019. And I said to him, what is this protective fencing over here? Let me go over and read that signage. What, what is going on on the beach here? And I walked over and I thought, well, this is interesting. There's an endangered species on this beach. I was starting from zero knowledge, zero. A year later, I was walking down that same beach, more curious about that fenced off area, trying to see if I could see any of these birds. And I bump into Tess Kohler who thankfully fielded a million of my questions enthusiastically as I asked about the plovers, asked about the staff, learned the best I could from the beginning about the birds. And I decided that I was gonna see if during the short periods of time when I'm up north, if I could weasel my way in to the volunteer team. Thank you, Erica, for taking a chance on me, <laughs> the woman with a million questions. So in 2021, I suited up and I started educating park visitors, just like Dan last year. I started doing plover safety checks up and down Sleeping Bear Point. There are two major mainland beaches where the plovers are located. And one is Sleeping Bear Point. Some of you know it as the Maritime Beach. It is right outside of Glen Haven, right near Glen Arbor. Um, so that is the beach that I started walking and um, learning how to do head counts, safety checks, um, monitoring for dogs. That's a big part of the job for the volunteers. And also honing my bird, my band reading skills. These birds move fast. They have teeny tiny bands on them. And so I would just practice for a few hours at a time to see what, what bands I could read. The next year I went back again during periods of time where I could get up north during breeding season and uh, had the most remarkable experience on the south end of the park where several captive reared chicks had been released with wild chicks on that beach. And these captive reared chicks had been driven to Sleeping Bear Dunes from Pennsylvania, where they were born. And they had very special bands on their legs, which I'll show you. But I, I could not believe what I was seeing, that these little birds were learning to acclimate with wild birds and getting ready to migrate south. And then last year, out of the blue, I received a text from Chelsea Loomis. Hey, Joan. Do you think you could come up north for four days and go out to North Manitou Island? We think we have a new dock pair on North Manitou Island. And I looked at John and I said, it's my big adventure. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say no. <laughs> so the dock, the dock, thank you for the question. The question is, what is the dock? So on North, there are two islands off of the mainland there, and I'll show you a map in just a minute. North Manitou Island being the larger island, South Manitou Island being essentially the day tripper island for people uh, on the ferry from Leland and back. But North Manitou Island is ground zero of Great Lakes piping plover breeding. And most of the attention on North Manitou Island is focused on one part of the island where Alice and Scott are doing their rotations, weekly rotations, but another pair had appeared on the dock where the ferry pulls up to North Manitou Island. And they needed eyes on that pair to confirm that there was indeed a pair and see me as the relative novice, if I could read the bands and tell them who the birds were. Big pressure. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I took him up on the offer. And within minutes, we did confirm that there was a new doc pair. I'll show you their picture in just a minute. And their names. I learned their names. Bro Bob, the male, and Pony. Pony being a one-year-old female showing up at North Manitou for the first time. And Bro Bob giving it his second try on North Manitou. That's how it started. And this is my pal, Bro Bob. <laughs> so... That photo I took, and I'm proud of it, because I was able to read his bands. And when I could read his bands and texted them to Chelsea and Alice, what I got back within seconds from Chelsea was, it's Bro Bob. She knows the bird. Wow, he has a name. And Alice saying to me, so that's where he went. Alice, of course, knows the entire family trees of these birds. And so both of them saying to me, you found our boy. Now you need to tell us if he has a lady friend and see if you can read her bands. Why so many bands? So the question is, why so many bands? I'll get to that in just a minute. Each one of these birds generally has four or five bands on its legs. And I'll show that to you in just a minute. But the remarkable story behind this little guy is that his egg was laid in Grand Marais in 2021. He lost both of his parents to predators, and so his egg was recovered and transferred to the Detroit Zoo. Bro Bob was born in the Detroit Zoo. And then he was driven north to the University of Michigan Biological Station in Pelston, where he was raised in captivity. Once he was ready, he was driven down to Sleeping Bear Dunes, where he was released with other wild chicks to get acclimated, to fatten himself up, and to get ready for migration. He did all of that successfully. He migrated. We don't know where yet, but I'm sure one of this team is going to be able to figure that out soon enough. And then returned to Dimmick's Point on North Manitou Island for his first return. Unfortunately, he lost his chicks to predation the first year, all four of them. And there's only really one clutch, okay, per season. So he migrated south again, and he came back to North Manitou Island last summer, where I met him and became his, his friend. And he decided he wasn't going to go back to Dimmick's Point because he hadn't had great luck there his first year. So he flew over to the dock. And he tried to catch the attention of a, of a lady friend there. Now, to your question about the bands, okay? Bro Bob's official name is written there in script, okay? But the way you read those bands is from the upper left thigh. OF stands for orange flag. All Great Lakes piping plovers have an orange flag on their upper left thigh. So anyone, essentially, whether they're in Michigan, Florida, Texas, Cuba, the Bahamas, they know when they see a piping plover with an orange flag, it's a Great Lakes plover. And that's a big deal, given how few there are. Then reading down the left leg, he has a light blue band, small b. Then he has a red band, r. Then going up on his right leg, he has a metal USGS band, with a nine digit serial number that is specific to Bro Bob. Every bird has one of those bands. And then the most interesting band on this little bird is the one on his right ankle. Because that band, what we call a split band, that band tells the story that this is a captive reared bird. And that researchers at the University of Minnesota and the federal government are following the captive reared birds, uh, the captive raised birds, to, to compare the differences in terms of their success rate, okay? Their longevity, their hatch rate, their fledge rate, their migration patterns. So that band is extremely important. Okay? And I'll show you a few more pictures of birding later on, a uh, uh, banding, a few more um, slides down. You said that was an orange flag. Yes. 
Yes, I'm sorry. The question in the room is orange flag. So the orange flag is that band you see in the upper left thigh. And that indicates it's a slightly different looking band than the other. It's got a little flag coming off of it. So that band indicates that that is a Great Lakes plover. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is the color band that all, all of the novice um, volunteers learn. The left column are the original co uh, colors of the bands that go on. The next column over is the fade to colors. And you can see how the red fades to what we call red R for rubber band. Okay, it goes from red to kind of that beigey rubber band color. All right, but this is the, this is the color key, and several new colors have um, gone on this list since this slide was made, including pink and N. And remember the female bird that I that I saw on North Manitou Island. Her name was Pony, right? So she received the first pink band ever put on, and she received a brown band N for brown. All right, now I'm gonna to get to kind of the meat of the uh, of Erica's slides, the national park slides. So you can, uh, you can, we can zoom out a little bit. This is the map of Sleeping Bear Dunes. And you can see there on the right, there is one large island to the north, that is North Manitou Island. Coming off of that, uh, on, the, on the lower portion of that uh, island is uh, a spit. And that is where Dimmick's Point is located. Dimmick's Point is cordoned off from the public beginning in April every year and remains cordoned off, I think, through the end of September. And only park staff are allowed in and out of that area because, as I said, that is the most important breeding area in all of the Great Lakes for these birds. South Manitou Island, not so much. Okay, There hasn't been a pair there in many, many years until last year. And this is the other part of this story. The thing that is remarkable about this team up north is every day is a moving target. Every day something different is happening and they have to respond to that. And that's why they need more volunteers. It is so labor intensive to continue to respond to a new dock pair, to, oh my gosh, is there a pair on South Manitou? So. This is precisely why volunteers are needed, but that gives you a good a good layout of the park. And for those of you who have not been to Sleeping Bear Dunes before, it is a lovely park. The vistas over Lake Michigan will knock your socks off. Absolutely gorgeous. But it's this bird conservation story that for me really knocks my socks off. These are some aerial views of the park. Again, most people appreciate the dunes, the fact that the dunes are a dynamic uh, ecosystem. It is a marvelous park. But again, the piping plover team is only looking at one area on the landscape, and that we refer to as the cobble. The cobble is the rocky area that is in from the soft sand, and that is the only habitat on which the piping plover will nest. I'll show you photos of that in a minute. Now, there are actually three different piping plover populations in North America. In the orange, you can see the Great Lakes population. The gold uh, uh, area there are the, is the Atlantic Coast population. And then that uh, gray area um, in the middle of the country and up into Canada is the Northern Great Plains population. Interestingly enough, these three populations do not intermingle. Very rarely do they intermingle, but they all migrate to the same locations, to the southern coastline of the Carolinas, Florida, Georgia, Texas, along the Gulf Coast in Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, lucky them, Bahamas, and even Cuba. And we know about a bird that flew to Cuba and wintered there um, again, by serendipity. Cuba was closed to international travel for many years, and when it opened up, a birder and photographer happened to spot a Great Lakes plover by the orange flag 
took a photo, sent it back up to the University of Minnesota, and suddenly we knew where whomever, where he was spending his winters. That's how we know where the birds are wintering. That's the range map. Okay? And then this map shows where the nesting areas are located across the Great Lakes. So the orange triangles are where the Sleeping Bear Dunes plover nests are located, and each one of those triangles indicates one or more nests. Okay, So along Sleeping Bear Point, generally there are five or, or six nests that, um, that are established every season. Down at the southern end of the park along Peterson Beach, um, this past season, I think there were six uh, nests again. And the Platte River area, um, also very successful. That part of the park, the team was delighted with last summer because there was a lot of activity. And then you can see the sparse distribution of the other uh, nesting areas um, around uh, the Great Lakes. Question, Joan? Yes. On your last slide? Yes. Um, I don't know if you were going to cover this, but I learned that that farthest west pair, the male was unbanded and the female was a Great Lakes population. So they, there was some speculation that the male might have been from the Great Lakes. Oh, oh, the Great Plains. The Great Plains. Yeah. So Juliet's comment in the room, for those of you on Zoom, that the upper western uh, triangles there you see may have included um, a pair of plovers, one banded as a Great Lakes plover and one unbanded that may have come from the Great Plains location. So it does happen periodically. Alice did mention that to me. So an interesting story. Is it the same bird, the same species? So it's the same species, but three different populations, yes. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of historic distribution on where the pl piping plovers were located in the early 1900s, okay, before the problem started to arise. So you can see um, wonderful distribution across all five Great Lakes. Um, when I look at this map, I see the shoreline of Illinois and Wisconsin and think, wow, that has really changed. Mm -hmm. But this is the distribution, okay, um, early in the 1900s. This is the late 1980s when the bird went on the endangered species list, okay? So really a remarkable change um, in a relatively short period of time, 60 years. Okay? And this is where we were in 2015 okay this is a this slide is a little bit old but you can see the difference between this and this and that definitely the momentum is moving in the right direction so very exciting but you'll all notice that most of the distribution is happening of course in michigan right I'll say again, we cheer all of the other Great Lakes states on when they have new pairs, but this is part of the story, right? That um, if we really are going to push for recovery, we need to make sure that the distribution of these pairs is across the Great Lakes region and that they are all not located in Michigan. So when, when the piping plover was listed on the endangered species um, list, uh, there were 17 known pairs that existed and record low, my understanding was 12 pairs. So imagine that under 25 known birds on the planet. Now there is nesting as of 2019, nesting on all five Great Lakes and into Canada. So remarkable. And in 2022, there were 72 pairs, okay? With 31 of those or 40% located at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. The piping plover recovery effort is managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife and includes many partners, federal, state, local, NGOs, volunteers, and outreach and education, very critical. That's the reason that I accepted uh, Dan's, uh, Dan's invitation. Here's a list, I'm sure it's not um, completely uh, um, up to date, but it is, uh, it is a listing, not exhaustive, of the many federal, state, and local partners. Um, you see three universities um, listed there. University of Michigan, is uh, its biological station, as I said, is located in Pelston, and that is where all of the captive rearing uh, occurs. Detroit Zoo, 
remarkable partner, and my understanding is during COVID, when protocols had to change, the Detroit Zoo stepped in and did um, did yeoman's work in terms of um, helping to recover eggs, um, helping to um, with with the chick hatching, um, and and maybe even the relay back up to uh, the biological station. But remarkable team effort, and again, a strong cadre of, of volunteers who are inspired by the by the teams. The piping plover, the size, not too large, not as big as a robin, not as small as a chickadee, and its coloring is intentional. This bird is all about camouflage. It is so vulnerable out on the beach that it has to camouflage itself against the sand. And so the top of its head and its back is sand colored for a reason. When predators fly overhead, and I have not seen this personally, but when predators fly overhead, I'm told that the birds flatten themselves out on the sand so that they basically make themselves invisible to the, to the, to the raptors over, overhead. Kildur. But it's due to that, that sand color. The killdeer do that too. That, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. There are many lookalikes, many lookalikes. The one um, that causes the most confusion with piping plovers is the killdeer. And I'm chuckling to myself because Dan told me when I met him on the beach, he said to me afterwards, thank you so much for pointing out the plover. I was specifically focused on the killdeer. I, I, I did this to, to Dan. Uh, there's the chick is, is over here. Don't look over here. It's over, it's over, it's over here. So they're, e they're easy to confuse, okay? For those of you who aren't expert birders, obviously there's lots of guides up there um, um, listed uh, to uh, to identify the birds, but um, piping plovers have one neck collar, killdeer have two neck collars. That's the easiest thing to remember. And the semi-palmated plover, that is a darker bird, looks a lot like a piping plover, it's just darker in color. This is a piping plover's winter plumage. Not too much to write home about. Very cute, but kind of a, you know, a ubiquitous little shorebird. Um, there is no black bands at all on the bird, and the beak is completely black. But things get very interesting, very flashy, very stylish come breeding season. The male has a thick black collar, very thick. He also has a headband that connects one eye to the other and his beak changes color and becomes two colors, orange and black. The female looks very similar to the male and I can't always identify between a male and a female. The team up north of course can, but her neck collar as you can see is kind of notched in the front. It gets narrow and then it's kind of wide on the side. So it's not that heavy black collar that you see across the front of the male. And her little headband doesn't quite connect her eyes as heavily as his, right? But subtle differences. Her beak also changes color. And you can see they're wearing plenty of bling, both of these birds. Their breeding season is short, sadly. It's hard to see them go. The males start arriving in mid-April along Great Lakes shorelines, and then the females follow. And sometime in May or June, the female will lay three or four eggs in the cobble areas, those large kind of flat stones that you see in both of the pictures. That is their specific habitat need. They will not lay their, they will not nest in the dune grass. They will not nest on sandy open areas. It needs to be that cobble. And again, that is a camouflage tactic. You can see one small egg in the nest up top. I'll show you more pictures there, but you can see mm -hmm. the shape and the size of the nest. And essentially the male in a courting ritual makes a little divot with his back legs like this. It's called a scrape. It's part of the courtship. And she decides if she likes his scrape or not. He'll keep trying if she doesn't. And when she decides that she likes the scrape that he has made, she will embellish that little divot with little pebbles, okay? And that's what you can see in the picture up top. The males and the females share incubation duties, two-hour shifts, remarkable to watch. 
uh, really remarkable. And they let one another know when it's time I'm, I'm on and you're off and you're going to feed and you're going to hydrate and I'll see you in, in two hours, but there's communication there. And then, and then off he or she goes. Now, sometimes one of the partners will go AWOL. And I have gotten texts from Chelsea saying, could you go out to Sleeping Bear Point? We have a female or a male who's gone AWOL for longer than four hours. And so-and-so staff member needs to go. You think you can go out there and monitor and see if that change of shift happens. Sometimes the AWOL happens overnight. We all get a little worried. And thankfully, the next morning, I got texts on both of those birds I went out to monitor saying so-and-so returned. But two-hour shifts generally. From June to July, the, the chicks hatch during the very busiest tourist season, and they are extremely vulnerable before they can fly. They're uniquely banded, generally between day 6 and 12, before they can fly. And if they return the next year, then they get a second set of bands. Um, the, they're adult bands, they call them. I can't stress how vulnerable these little tiny birds are on the shore. I'll show you a video clip and you'll see just how small they are. But it is a very perilous time in June and July when we are encouraging the public to watch where they're walking so they don't step on birds keep the dogs off the beaches where the dogs should not be in the first place. Every day is, uh, it's, 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 it's high drama in terms of making sure that the birds are safe. Then in July and late August, first the females will leave and start to migrate, then the males making sure that the chicks are fine and then the chicks go last. They migrate individually, by the way, they don't migrate in flocks. And as I said before, the distribution of where they winter over um, is is along the states listed there in the slides, and we have photographic proof of that from wonderful birders and photographers that send photographs to the University of Minnesota team. Here's another graphic just showing that plover timeline, okay, and how quickly that breeding season happens. But remember, the team at Sleeping Bear Dunes is working 16-hour shifts, probably, okay, their commitment during this period of time is absolutely remarkable. And they have to be their fittest because they're walking miles and miles of shoreline every single day. So the commitment is, uh, is truly extraordinary. These are the scrapes that I described earlier. The left one, you can almost barely see. It's a little indentation in that uh, rocky area. The one on the lower right, a little bit more visible because it's in a bit of soft sand there. But again, it's basically the male just taking his legs, paddling in the back there, and pushing some of that sand away to create the divot. And this is what a nest with a full clutch looks like with those little pebbles that she has embellished the, uh, the scrape with. They also are sand colored. And when the birds start, um, start laying eggs, um, the number of staff that are allowed past the fencing to look for nests and then begin to put these wire cages on top that I'll show you, it is, it is a perilous time so that the eggs are not stepped on, right? It takes um, concentration from the part of the staff uh, and, uh, and, and vigilance. And again, it's a, it's a moving target. Here is a bird that is inside what we call an exclosure. It is a hard wire cage that once a nest is established, the team moves in, builds these new every season, okay? A lot of labor goes into this. I'll show you a picture. It's got soft mesh on the top. It's protecting the incubating bird from ground predators and from aerial predators, all right? You can see she has four eggs there in the clutch, sand colored. Um, and uh, yeah, the, I love these photos because it really, uh, it, it shows how almost invisible those eggs are. And then this is where the cuteness factor comes in. Again, all leg and feet, okay? It's got a nice uh, healthy bill on it, really from the very beginning, and these large almond-shaped eyes. 
They feed themselves really from the moment that they're born. The parents do not feed the chicks. So they, um, within hours, are up and running around and are, um, are, are feeding themselves. And you can actually see that happening on the far right there. The chick at six days old is, uh, is crouching down and is, uh, and is feeding itself. You can also see that six-day-old chick has already been banded. Okay. Yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. The question is what they eat. I'll get to that in just a minute. Now you can see the growth factor. You can see that the bird on the right at 14 days is beginning to look like it's developing some feathers and losing some of that, that fuzzy look. The legs continue to grow, okay? And this is the bird at, at, at three and four weeks. So um, really a lovely, a lovely bird. The uh, the white feathers along its belly kind of curl up around its body and give it that lovely feathery look. Okay, just a just a beautiful little bird, and its adult beak is uh, is definitely coming in by by this time. And this is this is a full grown chick, ready to migrate. Okay, it's uh, looks a little contemplative, uh, thinking about its journey ahead, but. Um, Beautiful, beautiful little birds. Now I'm going to try to play you three short clips from YouTube. So hang with me here. The first one is that brooding behavior that I described to you, where the chicks are not able to regulate their own body temperature. And so they try to push up under the adult. So that's a good question. It is not currently on the nest. Okay, it is sitting in the sand now. And, and so there is no exclosure in that pic. That's very good observation. Yeah, it's not, it's not protected under its exclosure. It's sitting out on the beach. And that, that happens frequently. And of course, that's a, that's a risking move on the part of that adult bird, right? If something were to fly overhead. Whoops. Lost it. So get back in presenter mode here. Oh, we like the bar. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the next one now. This is a newborn chick, and watch how wobbly it is on its legs, okay?
here is the last one, and this is uh, a territorial dispute. So there are three birds in this very short clip, but they puff themselves up, they make a specific noise, and the goal is stay out of my territory. Not clear to me if these birds already have partners or not, but they are clearly three males who are trying to defend their territories. Throughout the, throughout the season. Okay. The public on where to walk along the shore is one of my jobs. And the goal is not to alter their behavior on the shoreline if possible. So we, it's clear that there is the fencing is up. What I loosely refer to as fencing, and I'll show you a picture in a, a moment, a cordoned off area. Obviously, the public cannot go past that area. But we also ask them not to walk in the sandy area because the sandy area is where the little chicks are running back and forth be between the shoreline and the cobble area, which is the, behind the fencing. So walking really right by the water is the goal. Um, we also tell uh, uh, park visitors, if plovers approach you, basically just give them space, okay? Share the shore with them, let them walk around you. And if a plover starts to do what we refer to as a broken wing display, um, which is basically trying to attract your attention so you're not focused on their nest or their chick, then just slow down and, and back up and give them space. Plover's foraging style is also very distinctive. They forage by sight, so they look down the beach, they run fast, they grab what they're looking for, and then they look for the next morsel. So they are different from other shorebirds in that regard. And to your point earlier, what do uh, python plovers eat? They eat a variety of insects, crustaceans, and when they're in their wintering ground, they, um, they love marine worms. So that is a steady diet for them um, down in the south. Why are plovers endangered? There's a, a multitude of reasons. One, uh, depending on the season, are changing lake levels. So when lake levels rise, the risk of nest washout, if nests are too close to the shore, um, is very real. And there have been sad years in the past where nests and eggs have been lost because of the rising levels. Um, so the goal, if, if that occurs, the goal of the team is to rush in and rescue the eggs as quickly as possible and again transfer them to, uh, to the Detroit Zoo. Predation is a big issue at the park um, and in other locations around the Great Lakes. Coyote are on both the mainland and on North Manitou. Merlins are particularly tricky because they are um, ferocious predators, but they also like to take out the adults. And once one adult is taken out, then it's very unlikely that the remaining adult is going to be able to raise the chicks to fledging solo. And so those uh, chicks also need to be recovered. Ravens and gulls hang around. They snatch up chicks very quickly. And of course, we consider dogs predators. So dogs can do, they can certainly run after chicks or adults, but they also often cause adults to abandon their nests just from the fear factor alone. So the no dog rule on several beaches uh, in the park during breeding season, it's a hard and fast rule. There are some beaches in the park that are open to dogs and we do our level best to, um, to gently redirect park visitors to those beaches, um, but dogs continue to be a, a, a serious uh, issue. Human pressures, particularly during um, wintering months when there are vehicles in some of the states right on the wintering grounds. And of course, habitat loss related to shoreline development because of that very specific nesting habitat that the birds have to have. This graph we should all cheer about because this graph shows that last season there were more pairs across the Great Lakes than any year previously since the birds were listed on the endangered species list. Mm -hmm. 
we reached 80 pairs of piping plovers across the entire Great Lakes. So that is a remarkable feat and is being celebrated. You can also see on this line graph that we have had some challenging years. This was obviously before I started volunteering, but those downward trends, well, not to give myself credit, seasonal changes and those water levels. And I've heard those stories right along the Maritime Beach uh, in the Sleeping Bear Point area that I walk and predation, right? Predation is heartbreaking. Um, when you look at the data from one day or one week to the next, you see how many chicks have not made it through the week. And so there's a variety of factors that have contribute to the downtrend, but um, the team is cheering across the Great Lakes because of, the, of reaching the 80 um, pairs this slide and S SLBE is also Sleeping Bear Dunes. It's just another acronym that's used. This slide shows um, really the proportion of the entire Great Lakes activity that is happening at Sleeping Bear Dunes. So 32 pairs of the total 80, 126 eggs laid, 39% of the total Great Lakes, uh, of the Great Lakes total. 112 chicks hatched, more than half of the Great Lakes total happening in just that one park. And 60 wild chicks fledged. So fledging means when the when the chick um, reaches between the age of three to five weeks, more like four to five weeks, and they officially leave the nest. That fledge rate is extremely important. That's basically the survival rate of the of the chicks. 47% of the total Great Lakes uh, um, number of wild chicks fledged. The recovery goal, the federal recovery goal for piping plovers is 1.5 to two chicks per pair fledged. And so last year, despite the fact that there were losses of chicks on North Manitou Island, the team achieved the federal goal of 1.88 chicks fledged per pair. So re remarkable. Still, there's a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. How many of the Great Lakes clubs end up getting banned? Hundred percent. How many? The question in the room is how what what um, how many of the uh, Great Lakes plovers get banded? So, I can really only speak to Sleeping Bear Dunes. The goal is 100% of them are, are banded. That is the goal. Um, they come very close to that goal because of the relentless efforts of the three banders that I mentioned. I, I, I don't know, Keith, what the, what the success rate is across the remainder of the Great Lakes. Yeah. But the goal is to band and to band early, right before the chicks can fly. This is just a different way of presenting the sleeping bear contribution of, of um, piping plover pairs, um, the proportion that are coming from sleeping bear dunes in red um, compared to the entire, uh, entire population of the Great Lakes. So remarkable numbers. Um, and this is a story that really Michiganders, I think, do not have a grasp of. They just do not realize how profound the story is and, and what is going on up north with regard to these birds um, and how other teams across the Great Lakes learn from this team uh, and, and in terms of their conservation success. Now we're heading into the final part of the presentation. I'm gonna talk about each one of these management strategies at the park um, be, and I'll show you some pictures so you understand this is a multi-pronged conservation approach. The first and most remarkable to me is the daily monitoring. Every egg, every chick, every adult is federally protected and must be counted and must be reported to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So the hours on the beach, walking the beach and head counting is remarkable. I bumped into one of the interns last summer, delightful young woman, and I had a very brief conversation with her. And then she looked at me a little frazzled and she said, I need to go. I have 19 chicks I need to find. And that was her job for the next few hours was to make sure that she counted each one of those chicks. The psychological fencing is that loose fencing that I mentioned to you, not a fence so much as roping, but with the signage to the public, these areas are, are no longer open to the public during nesting season. The exclosures, those wire cages that I mentioned to you, bird banding, predator management, primarily on North Manitou, um, but on the mainland too, if needed, the captive rearing program, 
and public outreach and education. And of course, trying to pull in more volunteers to, um, to commit some time to, uh, to helping this bird. This line graph shows two of these strategies on a timeline and the fact that both of these strategies likely have helped not only sleeping bear plover numbers, but also Great Lakes numbers. So in the late 1980s, the exclosure use, those wire cagers began. And in the early 1990s, the captive rearing program started. And you can see the numbers begin to increase um, to some degree because of those two management strategies. This is a picture of the psychological fencing. You can see it is literally just orange uh, roping. Each one of those green poles has a sign that says this is a federally protected bird. It, 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 uh, it um, describes the implications of crossing that line. There are fines that are associated with doing that. There's also plenty of signs that are installed indicating that no dogs are allowed on those nesting beaches. Um, but it doesn't hold back much, right? It takes, uh, it, takes, um, it takes the will of park visitors not to move into those areas. This is another picture. You can see how much area is, uh, is, is roped off. And this is a picture of the uh, wire exclosure. The sides are, um, are uh, rigid wire and the top is more like a mesh. Um, they are not 100% foolproof, but they allow the adult and the chicks to move in and out of that area. Again, the incubation shifts that I mentioned earlier, and it protects them from the aerial predation um, of Merlin and, and, other, uh, and other raptors, but installed and then removed every single season. And this is a plover on, uh, on, on its nest, uh, incubating eggs inside of that exclosure. This is a picture of the team that assists with banding the chicks. Now, it takes a lot of volunteers to do this. I have not observed this, but I'm hoping too soon. It takes a lot of, uh, of volunteers to encircle a family of chicks slowly making the circle smaller and smaller and smaller. And then with their very floppy fabric chick catchers, they basically put the little uh, fabric uh, um, <laughs> frisbee on top of the chick, put it into a cloth bag, weigh it, take a buckle sample, mouth sample, and then proceed with the banding but it takes quite a few people to encircle the little, the little chicks and catch them because they, they move very quickly. Here's a picture of the banding process. It looks like they use a, a, almost a, a small tweezers to, uh, to apply the bands. And remember there's that metal USGS band that goes on the, on the bird that is the unique identifier to each one of the chicks. And then once the birds are banded and they really, this it happens very quickly, the birds are not, um, they're not hurt and they really are in and out of the hand very quickly. They're all released simultaneously. So no chick gets left behind by an adult that is alarmed by that and moves into the cobble area with three of its four chicks. So they're released simultaneously. And then the parent is there on the right. You can see three chicks there on the beach and one is kind of hiding behind the parent but they're now fully banded and the, uh, the adult is probably calling to those four chicks, it's time to run into the cobble area. And so the chicks will follow the adult in. So that is banding. And then, as I said, if those birds come, those newly banded birds come back the next season, then their, their uh, chick bands are exchanged for adult bands and then those birds are not touched again. It really is, um, they are in the hand only twice in their life is my understanding. And this is the captive rearing facility, University of Michigan Biological Station. Again, whether they are recovered as eggs or as chicks because their parents have been predated, this is where they grow up. There are adorable photos of them under feather dusters that are used in lieu of an adult for brooding. So the feather dusters come in handy for the chicks. And when they're ready, they are moved outside in an enclosed area. They learn to forage in the water. 
They um, they form community among themselves out in the out in the open, and when they are ready, then they are transferred down to Sleeping Bear or other locations, um, and are released to acclimate with wild chicks, um, and uh, and hopefully to um, to migrate successfully. Last year was the first instance where captive reared chicks from the U of M Biological Station were released outside of Michigan. It was another important milestone because U.S. Fish and Wildlife, as I said earlier, does not want all of the piping plovers to be located in Michigan. And they felt there were enough piping plovers in Michigan now that they could relocate them to locations in Illinois and one location in New York. So those birds were flown to their respective locations and starting their lives in another state. So my call to action slide, please consider donating some of your time to this team up North. It will be an experience that you will not forget um, you will have so much fun. This is a wonderful, friendly, welcoming team, and they are so grateful for volunteers. Reserve your campground spot now. Spend some time educating yourself about Great Lakes piping plovers. Borrow or buy a good pair of binoculars because those birds move fast. Sign up for volunteer training, and the next slide will show you who to contact. And... As a volunteer, you will get one of these cool National Parks baseball caps. I was so excited to get mine. <laughs> I'll never grow up to be a park ranger, but this is as close as I'll get. So very exciting. And last year, these wonderful informational lanyards were developed by Tess Kolar to share with the public. Most of the information that I've covered here is on this lanyard, flip style. And so we can show the public where the beaches are, where the dogs should be, what a pipe and plover looks like, the development of the chicks through their early lifespan. It's a wonderful resource and where to walk on the beach. Spend some time learning about the color band chart because the faster you do that, the more you're gonna be able to help the staff and really enjoy getting to know these birds as individuals. They're very charismatic. Some of them are the sweetest. Little Pony out on North Manitou Island was the most contemplative, sweetest little bird I think I've ever seen. And others are really um, birds that have a lot of personality because they know how to protect their young at that park, particularly when there's so many park visitors. So each of them has personality. These are some resources. I know Dan said that this um, presentation is being recorded, so you'll be able to look these resources up. Um, those first two webinars, I personally have found very informative, and that's teams across the Great Lakes essentially giving their end of season summaries. And Vince, again, is the wildlife biologist at Sleeping Bear Dunes, and that is the individual that you should contact if you are interested. Of course, Juliet and Dan can also direct you to me, and I can direct you to Vince um, in order to, um, to be helpful if you're interested. Thank you again so much for coming. I really appreciate it, and um, I'm hoping to see some of you on the beach like I did Dan last summer. Thank you. <laughs> So I will start first if there's any questions in the room. Yes, go ahead. So the question is, what is a piping plover's lifespan? Wonderful question, because there's a story attached to that. The uh, average lifespan is five years, but Sleeping Bear Dunes has a 15-year-old plover. Her name is Gabby. She nests just down Sleeping Bear Point, and she is a legend at the park because she has successfully fledged 33 chicks. Imagine that. 15 years old, 33 chicks. But the exciting part of the story, Gabby, is that she was spotted in the wintering grounds about two weeks ago. And someone took a photo of her and sent it to the team, and I could hear the cheering from Sleeping Bear Dunes. 
everyone was thrilled that she had successfully migrated to the wintering grounds because every year they wonder, is she going to make it safely down and is she going to make it safely back? She nests in the same spot every year. And thankfully, it is up Sleeping Burr Point where there is less traffic. She has a consistent partner, and I laid eyes on her for the first time last season, and it was so exciting. Um, so, um, so thank you for the question. Five-year average lifespan, but um, but Gabby is uh, is is a fifteen-year-old. How much time do you spend up? How much time do I spend up there? Not enough. <laughs> so I try to aim for between two and three weeks, different segments throughout the breeding season. So sometimes I'm up for four days. Last year, I had more flexibility. So I was up there for a longer stretch of time. They have developed a volunteer calendar. So I will, when I know what my schedule is going to be, I load in my hours to, to commit to that beach. And they know that I'm, that they know that I'm coming up. So, and they knew at the beginning that I didn't live close by. That's the other thing I really appreciate about this team. I said from the beginning, I live in Ann Arbor, but I'm going to do my best to come up here for, for four and five stretches of uh, four or five days at a time and, uh, and help you out. So, um, so again, for those of you who live in this area, uh, you know, it's, it's very possible and they love all volunteers. Well, I've been informed that you have two minutes. I'm going to get kicked out. Two minutes. Okay. All right. We're being informed that we have two minutes, so we're getting kicked out. Um, are there any? Are there, are, there are there are no questions online. All right. Then I'll thank everyone again for coming tonight, and uh, hope to see you at lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was fantastic. My pleasure. My pleasure. We can post your.